Okay, this is going to need a little bit of explanation. No, I'm not trying to SLI a 980 Ti with a 1070 Ti. For those of us still clinging to our CRTs in the year 2021, finding ways to actually get an analog VGA signal to them is surprisingly challenging. AMD ditched analog out on their Hawaii cards way back in 2013. NVIDIA, luckily enough for us CRT nerds, kept analog out in the form of a DVI-I connector up through the Maxwell series released in 2014 through 2015. The best of the bunch, the Maxwell Titan X, is the fastest consumer graphics card with analog out, but you can use a 980 Ti in a pinch, a bit like my secondhand EVGA card that I have here. And since the 980 Ti is now more than six years old, you can probably find one for really cheap on eBay. But the 980 Ti is starting to show its age. Don't get me wrong, it's still a fast card, but even modern, inexpensive, entry-level cards like the RTX 3060 are outperforming it by a lot. So suppose you have a modern graphics card, maybe even a bit more modern than my also secondhand 1070 Ti, and want to drive a CRT. What are your options? There are a lot, a lot of adapters to convert from HDMI, DisplayPort, or USB-C to VGA on the market, but the problem is that very few, if any, operate with a high enough pixel clock to match the 400 megahertz DACs that have been native on graphics cards since, I don't know, 2000? Here's a cheap HDMI to VGA adapter I have, which is not amazing, but there are better converters available. Probably the best place to check in on the newest and greatest VGA adapters is Hardform's FW900 thread, which is still active and has been since 2005. But so far, nothing is currently available that can quite match the capabilities and ease of use of having VGA out directly on your graphics card. This brings us back to why I have both graphics cards installed in the same system. Wouldn't it be great if we could have the fast, modern graphics card do all the rendering, but then have the old VGA-capable card send those frames to the monitor? Very early this year, Julio Santos tweeted about a new feature available in a Windows Insider build that allowed any GPU to be used as the graphics renderer. You may be thinking, hasn't this been around for a while? Sort of. Windows 10 does allow the option to switch between a power-saving and high-performance GPU, but that strictly means using integrated graphics as the power-saving option. With this new Insider build, though, you can now freely select any GPU in the system. Julio used this to get FreeSync working on a 980 Ti by passing its rendered output through an AMD 260X, which is pretty cool. But uh, I've got other plans, and I suspect you know where I'm going with this. So, here we are, and here I am running a Windows 11 Insider build. I'm a little late to the party, but I'm not the type to live the Windows Insider lifestyle. Running Insider builds on your main system is a bit like living your life a quarter mile at a time. I'll leave that to the young and reckless, but I am willing to dedicate a spare SSD to see if this GPU pass-through thing actually works. A quick bit about the setup first. The system is a 7700K on a Z270 motherboard, which means that the two GPUs are both running in PCIe by 8 mode. I'll touch on that later. I've got my 21-inch P1130 CRT connected to the 980 Ti, and there is nothing, nothing at all, connected to the 1070 Ti. Let's start with 1920 by 1440 at 86 Hz. Most cheap VGA adapters were only designed for 1920 by 1080 at 60 Hz, so this is already pushing past that. In Windows 11's new graphics menu, I'm going to go down to uh, Doom Eternal and choose Options. If I ignore power saving and high performance, I can choose a specific GPU. And to start, I'm going to stick with the 980 Ti, just to get a baseline. This will be direct from the GPU to the CRT. While loading the game, Doom Eternal's menus run at more than 2000 FPS. Scary for the EVGA card but we can see that the 980 Ti is doing all the work here. The 1070 Ti is completely idle, as we'd expect. Same thing in-game. This 980 Ti is running pretty juiced at 1.4 GHz, hitting 230 watts, and is pushing about 93 FPS. That's not bad, and since the frame rate is above the refresh rate of the CRT, I could cap the FPS down back to 86 and get a clearer, smoother gameplay experience than what any current LCD can achieve. And, at 1920 by 1440 the game looks amazing on a CRT. But back to Windows 11's graphics menu. Let's now see if we can run Doom Eternal on the 1070 Ti by passing its output through to the 980 Ti. <laughs> it's working! 
look at the GPU utilization for the 1070 Ti. The frame rate in the loading menu is much lower, around 4 to 90 FPS, which isn't really low, but it's definitely lower than 2000. Keep that in mind. Now let's see it in game. Same scene, 100% utilization for the 1070 Ti, pushing 105 FPS. Notice that the CPU utilization has gone up a little bit. In contrast to the 980 Ti, I've got the 1070 Ti running undervolted, 1924 MHz at 0.881 volts, so it's only using 120 watts. Pretty impressive. I was actually talking about the undervolt, but it's also impressive that this even works in the first place. That's 105 1920 by 1440 frames passing from the 1070 Ti to the CPU to the 980 Ti every second. Surely there must be some latency, right? We'll get to that soon, I promise. I know many of the CRT nerds out there are wondering if what we're seeing is some Windows-composited, v-synced, unevenly frame-paced mess, but it's not. Currently, Doom Eternal is running in exclusive full-screen mode, but Windows Desktop Manager is doing the composition properly, not interfering at all with a frame presentation. This really is full-screen v-sync off. To show that it's working, I can enable RTSS's 4-bar frame sequence, which is one of the best ways to see tear lines on screen. For the non-CRT nerds, normally tearing is bad, but the tearing here indicates we're getting the pristine, unmodified output of the 1070 Ti presented just as if the 980 Ti were rendering it. This is pretty exciting. WDM is also doing the proper thing in borderless mode, so the tearing is still visible, which again is what we'd like to see. Even windowed mode works, but now we're not getting partial torn frames, which is the expected behavior. Okay, so it works in Doom Eternal. What about other games? Here's Rage 2, another Vulcan game. Using just the 980 Ti uncapped, the menu, just like Doom Eternal, runs crazy fast, nearly 800 FPS. But when selecting the 1070 Ti as the rendering GPU, the menu frame rate drops way down to around 480. But otherwise, everything else works flawlessly. The 1070 Ti hits about 111 FPS, whereas the 980 Ti can only do 100. Not much difference. The math there is a bit too hard for me to do in my head, but just imagine if you had a graphics card that wasn't from 2017. And to definitively prove that the 1070 Ti is actually doing the rendering, how about some Quake 2 RTX, a game that can't even run on the 980 Ti? Ray tracing is obviously very slow on Pascal cards, but we can use another nice attribute of CRTs. Let's go back to 1997 and use 640 by 480. Ah, Quake 2 RTX running at 640 by 480 at 85 FPS, rendered on a 1070 Ti, passed to a 980 Ti, and displayed in all its glory on a CRT made in 2003. Good stuff. So far, that's three Vulcan titles where this GPU pass-through works really well. But what about DX11, DX12, and OpenGL? Control is another useful game to test because it has both DX11 and DX12 executables, and the DX12 version will even allow me to enable ray tracing. But let's start with the DX11 version first. Yep, works great. VSync off or on. Now what about DX12? Same. And in DX12 mode on the 1070 Ti with ray tracing, take a look at this. 20 FPS, not bad. So far, so good. Every game I've shown has worked almost exactly as if the 980 Ti were doing the rendering, minus the issue about why we can't get 2000 frames per second, which I will get back to. But there are games where the GPU pass-through misbehaves a bit. Forza Horizon 4 is an interesting one. I've had to switch over to Nvidia's frame view for the overlay, but we can still see that the 1070 Ti, the second GPU in the list, I think, unless of course I have the fastest 980 Ti on the planet, but the 1070 Ti is doing the actual rendering work. What I'm showing now is the game running with vSync off, and we are getting proper tear lines. Watch the light poles as I drive past. But there's a problem when engaging vSync. With vSync set to on, 
Horizon is cutting the frame rate to one quarter of the monitor's refresh rate, so at 86Hz on the CRT, the game is capped to 21.5 FPS. Interestingly, this behavior can be fixed if you bring up Microsoft's game bar and pin one of the widgets to the screen. So there's a big caveat here for those of you interested in driving your CRT with GPU pass-through rather than with a VGA adapter. Some games will work fine, others maybe not so much. That brings us to OpenGL, which turned out to be very confusing. In Windows 11's graphics menu, selecting the rendering GPU for OpenGL games has no effect at all. For something like Quake 2 Pro, which should easily run at 1000 FPS on the 980 Ti, no matter what option I selected, the game seemed to be hitting a limit of around 270 FPS while using both GPUs at around 50%. That's strange. Same thing with Easy Quake as well. Why and how is the 1070 Ti being used at all? Only disabling the 1070 Ti in Device Manager would allow OpenGL games to appropriately use the 980 Ti. I was so confused about why I couldn't just render OpenGL games with the 980 Ti that I went back to plain old Windows 10. With the same setup as before, the 1070 Ti as a headless secondary GPU, I loaded up Doom 2016 with the OpenGL executable. Huh. 99% utilization on the 1070 Ti. Okay. I guess I'm getting GPU pass-through whether I want it or not. If anyone knows what's going on with OpenGL, please let us know in the comments. Anyway, let's finally get back to that issue we saw with Doom Eternal, where the 980 Ti was natively rendering at 2000 FPS in the menus, but when passing through the 1070 Ti's frames, that dropped to 490 FPS. Why such a drastic drop? Wait, is it even possible to transmit 2000 1920 by 1440 RGB frames every second over a PCIe 3.0 by 8 bus? To test this, I used a program called Benchmark DX9 Black White by Not That. You can also try his human benchmark to test your reflexes, but the black white executable is really a better version of my UE4 black white build that I use for input lag testing. I can't get my UE4 build to run much faster than about 1200 FPS on my 7700K, but not that's DX9 program will run at more than 6000 FPS. 6000 FPS is obviously not a realistic frame rate target for any game, but we can use Windows 11's GPU pass-through with Not That's program to see just how many frames are possible to transmit over the PCIe bus at a variety of resolutions. For this test, I checked resolutions from a very low 920x690, 635,000 total pixels, all the way out to a ridiculous, for a CRT anyway, 2840x2130, with more than 6 million pixels. Remember that in all cases with the native 980 Ti rendering, the frame rate was well above 6000 FPS. But when transferring a 920x690 image from the 1070 Ti to the 980 Ti, the pass-through frame rate dropped to 2150 FPS. If we do the math, 920 times 690 pixels times 8 bits per color times 3 colors times 2150 FPS, we get a throughput of around 4.1 gigabytes per second. With the same throughput computations run for each resolution, 1340x1005, 1600x1200, and finally 2840x2130, the maximal amount of data that's capable of being sent over the PCIe by 8 bus seems to top out at around 4.8 gigabytes per second. I'll leave that to someone who knows more about PCIe lanes and transmission than I do to figure out why that's happening, but I'd also be curious to see the results from someone with a high-end desktop motherboard with more or faster PCIe lanes. Anyhow, for the CRT guys out there, this shouldn't present too much of a limitation unless you were intending to play games at many hundreds of FPS and at high resolutions. The cheapo VGA adapter, though, doesn't have this problem at all. Okay, well what about input lag? I mentioned earlier that there must be some latency involved as each frame journeys from the 1070 Ti to the CPU and back to the 980 Ti. Well, not that's program is great for this as well. I have my microcontroller initiate a key press over USB, which tells Not That's program to switch from black to white, and I record the response with my light probe. It's important here that the light probe is around 25 centimeters away from the monitor. That allows me to capture the very first change to white, even if it occurs at the very top or very bottom of the screen. Measurements taken with the probe directly attached to the center of the screen won't accurately show the true input to photon delay. Here's what 128 results look like plotted on a chart. I love these because they look like crazy spirograph art, but the important thing is when we first see a rise out of the steady state low measurement. 
In this case, we're looking at the 980 Ti rendering not that's black to white program at 6,000 FPS. And look at the average result, 0.8 milliseconds, and the best result of 0.5 milliseconds. That is incredible. There are a lot of other YouTubers who delve into input lag and latency optimizations, but this is the reason why I don't fall down that rabbit hole. 0.8 milliseconds average input to photon latency from a completely unoptimized Windows 11 install, no startup processes disabled, RAM timings not tightened, processor not overclocked. To echo the conclusion from my input lag revisited video, don't hit the VSync wall. Run your games at as high a frame rate as you can without hitting 100% GPU utilization, of course, and you'll be fine. Don't sweat the small stuff. Now, obviously no modern games run at 6,000 FPS. And while normally I run input lag tests at 1,000 FPS, sticking with the same resolution we've been using, 1920 by 1440 at 86 hertz, I need to keep in mind that I actually can't pass 1,000 frames per second over the PCIe bus, so I need to use a lower frame rate. 400 FPS should be a nice value, high enough to mimic a very performant game, something like CSGO or Rainbow Six Siege, while also not running into the PCIe bus limitation. So here are the three cases I want to initially test. Number one, the 980 Ti natively rendering at 1920 by 1440 at 400 FPS. This should give us the baseline latency. Number two, the cheap HDMI to VGA adapter at the same 1920 by 1440 at 400 FPS. This will test whether or not the adapter adds any lag. And number three, the 1070 Ti passed through to the 980 Ti, also at 1920 by 1440 and also at 400 FPS. Dropping way down from 6,000 FPS to 400 FPS does see a slight increase in average latency, now at 2.1 milliseconds, with a spread from 0.7 milliseconds to 3.7 milliseconds. But this is still fantastic. I don't think any human could discern a difference between 0.8 milliseconds and 2.1 milliseconds of lag. Consider this a best case scenario for a really high FPS game. Let's now see how the HDMI adapter performs. The exact same. Don't get too caught up in the decimals here. We're not worried if something beats something else by 10 microseconds. The HDMI to VGA adapter adds no lag at all. That's good to know. Now onto the interesting case, the 1070 Ti's output being passed through to the 980 Ti. Ah, there we have it. Average latency increases by about three milliseconds across the board. So yes, there is a lag penalty from using this GPU pass-through, which makes sense. Those 400 frames per second have to get shuffled around, but it's really not too bad. Same as before, I don't think anyone, even the pro esports guys, could notice a three millisecond increase in latency. But still, a black to white test program running at 400 FPS doesn't quite replicate real world games. So what about at higher GPU loads and lower frame rates? Well, here's a game. <laughs> <laughs> This is a little FPS test game I've been working on, and I'll talk more about it later. But importantly, it has all the same great UE4 features that some games are missing. Doom Eternal? Like an internal frame rate cap, adjustable resolution scaling, and it's even got FSR. Here I have it running at the same 4x3 1920x1440 resolution as before, with the frame rate internally capped to 120 FPS, a more reasonable and realistic frame rate than 400. The technique I'm using to measure latency, where I capture the entire screen changing from black to white based on a key press, is much harder to accomplish in real games. Weapon muzzle flashes are unreliable, and they only show up on part of the screen, so I might miss a frame buffer swap near the top or bottom of the image. One way around this is to have the microcontroller send not a key press, but a mouse movement. If I point the game camera at a nice dark section of the map, and with the in-game sensitivity high enough, that microcontroller initiated mouse movement will, on the very next frame, completely rotate the camera's viewport to a hopefully full screen bright image, which I can measure. Finding scenes where this is even possible in most games is challenging. I've managed to do it in Quake Champions and Destiny 2 and a few more, but it's not fun. Loading the game, positioning the character, getting kicked due to inactivity. But the biggest problem is finding a scene with enough contrast, which is especially important when measuring a CRT, which is constantly pulsing on and off. But it's a cinch with my little 3D FPS build here. Let's take a look at the latency results with the 980 Ti doing the rendering. 
Okay, an average of about 11 milliseconds, with a uniform spread of responses between 7 and 15. That's higher than not that's black to white build, but still very good. And now with the HDMI to VGA adapter. Based on the earlier results, we shouldn't see any difference. And, yep, same minimum, mean, and max. No latency from the adapter. And here's the 1070 Ti doing the rendering. Remember that there are no cables coming out of the 1070 Ti. We're seeing the frames it rendered pass through PCIe to the CPU, back to the 980 Ti, and out the back of that card as a VGA signal. Around 3 milliseconds across the board, again. The average rose from 11 milliseconds to 14, with the same increases in minimum and maximum. Not bad. So if you're still using a CRT, what should you do? What's great about using an older graphics card with VGA out, something like the 980 Ti, or even a GTX 960 or an AMD R9 285, is that driving a CRT with it is easy, and you get a very high quality 400MHz DAC, something that no adapter can yet touch, but it comes at the cost of being stuck with 2015 graphics performance forever. Back to Julio's tweet though, I'm so glad I saw it, and I'm really glad Microsoft is adding the functionality to choose a rendering GPU, mostly because it's really cool. Is it a viable way to drive your CRT with a modern graphics card? Eh, yes and no. It does work, mostly, but there are drawbacks. Having to run two GPUs all the time with all the associated heat and noise is just one of them. There's also the added complexity of having to manually select the rendering GPU for every game you want to play. It's not that difficult, but it's a step you don't need with a passive adapter. Pass-through also adds a bit of latency, but this is so slight, I don't think it's worth getting hung up on. But the biggest drawback is that it may or may not work depending on what game you're trying to play. That's not an entirely new notion for CRT owners. We've been using constant hacks and workarounds and custom resolutions since about 2009 to get PC games designed for 16x9 monitors and televisions working properly on 4x3 screens. But why can't it just be easy? Right now, unless you're keen on joining the Windows Insider program, the easiest way to get output to your CRT is probably just to use a VGA adapter. Disruptor, a user on Hardform, has a great list of available adapters and their capabilities, which I'll put a link to in the description. Some are expensive or hard to find, and none are completely free of issues, but they all require less work than running two GPUs. And that's it for this one. Thanks for watching.